This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman telephoning a travel agent to book a holiday. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, you're through to Go Travel. This is Darren speaking. How may I help you today? Hello, I'm calling to book a holiday. Great. May I take your name, please? Yes, it's Greaves, Anna Greaves. Is that G-R-E... No, G-R-I-E-V-E-S. And Anna is with double N. Right. Thank you, Anna. Now, we're delighted you've called us. Can I ask where you heard about us? Uh, it was your advertisement in uh, one of the magazines. Was it Holiday World? Oh, yes, that's the one. Good, thank you. It's useful to know. Of course. And did you have a particular holiday in mind, or was it a general inquiry? I think I've chosen. I like the look of the one with the code FT4551. The right destination and the prices seem reasonable. Right. Now, was it for yourself only, or...? Oh, no. I want to go with a couple of friends, so there'd be three of us going. OK. Now, there's a choice of dates, as you know. Yes, I think... Well, we've got to be back by the end of August, so if we say going on August the 16th, that would work fine. No problem. And you can also choose the length of your holiday. There's, let's see, 7, 11 or 14 nights. We thought the middle one would be great. Longer would be nice, of course, but... Maybe next year. Yes. And you do need to have insurance. Uh-huh. We've three levels... Standard, Super and Super Plus. Standard seems a bit basic. Let's say Super. That should be sufficient. Fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Well, that's all good so far, and the availability is OK. Have you looked through the list of options? They're in the advertisement. I have, and I've got the list here. Some of them do seem a good idea. Which ones would you like to take? In terms of the hotel, the offer of picnic lunches, we'd leave that. We'd rather go to cafes. I think a balcony for the room is a must. It's so nice to sit out, enjoying the view. Oh, yes. And then the trips. Uh, I think we'll pass on the night bus one. I never really enjoy the commentaries. And museums aren't really my sort of thing, to be honest, any more than dances. Uh-huh. But I like practical things, so I think the demonstration of local arts could be fun. Yes, I would think so. And then, in terms of getting out of town, going up the river on a boat sounds delightful, and I wouldn't want to miss that. But the mountains, well, sitting in a coach on those winding roads... I understand. OK, well, that's all I need for the booking at this point. 
Just a few details for you and then we'll check the payment. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a talk about Runwell, a charity that raises money by organising running races. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 17. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to tell you something about the Run Well charity and the work we do. I'll give a brief overview of what we do and I hope you may be able to help and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Runwell's founder, Mike Hughes, took up long-distance running in 1987, raising money by doing sponsored half-marathons, and in 1992 established the charity as we know it today. By 1997, the runs were being filmed by local TV, and today they appear on national TV every year. All the funds collected by Runwell go to the hospital with the idea that those fit enough to run use their energy to assist the provision of people who are unwell for whatever reason. Now, if you want to race, and I assume that's why many of you are here, let me explain a couple of the basics. Races are run by teams, so you need to form and register a team. What you wear to run in is up to you, and I know some teams come up with some pretty wacky ideas. We have a standard design for your numbers, which we ask you to reproduce. So you make them up according to that standard. We don't want to spend valuable funds on doing that ourselves. Now, the races run as a kind of relay, so while you won't actually compete side by side, we do recommend that you train as a group. This helps to optimise performance and build team spirit. It will also give you a fair idea of how much you need to eat and drink over the race distance. This is clearly essential for an effective performance, so please make sure you come along to the race with sufficient food and drink. Again, we don't spend money on providing that, but you do need to keep yourself going for the 20 kilometre course. The course goes through the town, then out through Highfield Park, concluding in the main square, where the applauding spectators will be ready to greet you. There are many different prizes, including oldest runner, youngest runner, team with the most sponsorship, team with the best costume. That one's donated by Zoom Fashions. The mayor will introduce the Minister for Health, who will hand over each prize to the winners, and then the hospital president will make a short speech. Before you hear the rest of the talk, 
You have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. OK, that's the big race. But I know there are many people who don't feel they are up to running a 20-kilometre race, but who would nevertheless like to raise money for Run Well. Over the years, we've had experience of many ways of trying to collect money, some very successful, others less so. Now, of course, 20 kilometres is too far for children to run. But there was a sponsored swimming event at the local school last year, and that did very well. People have also tried to organise food-based events, such as selling homemade cakes and bread and so on at the market. And there was a large picnic arranged in four bright gardens, although these events failed to justify the efforts put into them though I'm sure they were very tasty. These days, so many people are out at work all day that going from house to house to collect money isn't very effective. But it is possible to raise useful funds by selling small promotional items, such as badges with the Run Well motif on them. We're currently checking to see if postcards, perhaps showing the race's winners each year, might also be a good idea or not. We do appreciate the efforts that have gone into selling second-hand goods, but to be honest, the returns have not been very high on this. One very dedicated group organised a team quiz recently, which went very well, and it would be good to see more such activities. There's also been talk of a concert, but we'll have to see how plans for that progress. Now, are there any questions at this stage? That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between some university students about a recent field trip to a radio station. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Tim. Hi, Wendy. I heard your class went on a field trip to a radio station yesterday. Could you tell me about it? You see, I've been thinking of changing my major to communications or even possibly literature. I'm not really enjoying my science major. In fact, the way I've been feeling lately, I wish I had chosen an arts degree. I see. Perhaps communication might be a good course for you. I'm really enjoying it. The field trip helped me to see the realities of working in the industry. That's great. So the field trip was a good experience? It was a long day. We left at 8.30 and didn't return until about 5.30. So I was tired. But those are the kinds of hours you can expect working in radio. Anyway, although the day was long, it was probably the most beneficial day of study in the course so far. But Tim, isn't radio dying? I mean, with the internet and television, aren't people using the radio less and less? Yes, that's also what I thought. In fact, the idea almost stopped me from beginning my studies in radio communication. But after the radio station visit, I was clearly able to see that radio continues to reach nearly 95% of the population. I guess I'm going to have to change my ideas on the effectiveness of radio. Seems like radio has a huge reach, but are you certain about that? 95% seems a very big number. Yeah, 
I thought the same as you, but when I read these figures, I changed my thinking. Here, take a look at this. These figures are for a typical small town. Oh, I see the viewing patterns. When people listen or don't listen to the radio. Radio is quite popular in the mornings. Yes, the listening pattern of the public is quite interesting. I guess in some ways, the statistics weren't too surprising. Early on in the day, you know, before most people are heading off to work, the number of people listening is quite high. Mmm, around 25,000. Yes, and as people start heading to work... Mostly in their cars, the number of radio listeners increases quite dramatically. Yes, it makes sense. And you can clearly see that by noon, the number drops off considerably, only to pick up again around 5pm, probably for the drive home, and after that, well, it's, it's almost non-existent. So what are most people listening to? They gave us a graph about that. Let's see. Hmm. What was surprising to me was how close, you know, in terms of interest between listeners who tune in to win competitions and those who tune in specifically for news and weather. Of course, sports and sports commentary remains the most popular choice for listeners. Hmm, yes. Sports is easily the most popular. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Tim, I'm interested in finding out more about how radio programs are produced. Did they take you behind the scenes and let you see how a radio show is actually made? Yes, they did. And I learned there's much more to the process than I'd originally thought. Some things are really quite obvious. Take, for example, a one-hour show. Once you have decided upon your topic, you have to undertake the research, much like you would for any university assignment. You can't simply talk about any old thing. Preparation is very important. Mm, OK. Then next, I imagine, comes the interview itself? That's correct. And depending on what you're planning to put to air, you should write out the relevant scripts. There's a lot of preparation that comes with that as well. You should make sure that you have a good mix of open and closed questions. I learned that a good interviewer guides the whole process by balancing the amount of verbal input from both the interviewer and interviewee. Now, a running sheet, which you must also include as a key step in the process, gives details about the length of a particular section of the program. You've got to be very specific, down to the second. This means that the start and finish time for each section of the program must be carefully considered. Well, that all seems very good, but how does a person get a job in the radio industry? I imagine it's a very competitive field. Judging from what they said at the station, it's no more competitive than most professions. So it's easy to find employment in radio? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but there were a few things they mentioned that would increase your chances of finding employment in the field. Oh yeah? Like what? Well, there were a couple of things that stood out in my mind, and perhaps not what you might expect. For example, they didn't look favourably upon a university degree. They said it's better to use your time to build an audio library. Um, things like having a background in the music industry and an interest in certain types of music can actually go against you because working in different stations usually means exposure to different types of music. So you should be flexible in your musical tastes. Booking a celebrity guest and interviewing them was another way to maximise your employment chances. People are always interested in this type of thing. Knowing people in the industry can also be a disadvantage because people in radio are always looking for a fresh angle, something different. These were just some of the suggestions made. There were others, but they don't come to mind just now. Tim, thanks for this information. You've really helped me clarify my position about my studies next semester. Happy to help. All the best with your decisions for next semester. See you around, Wendy. See you, Tim, and thanks again. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You will hear the beginning of a lecture about turkey farming. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone. Ever since it was first served and eaten at the wedding feast of Charles XI of France and Elizabeth of Austria way back in 1570, the consumption of turkey meat has continued to grow. In recent years, the popularity and subsequent interest in turkey farming has also grown substantially and along with this interest, there have been a number of significant changes which have occurred in turkey production, which I'd like to point out to you all. In some of the larger companies in the UK, understanding of genetics has been used to good effect with selected stock showing an increase in growth rate and a higher proportion of lean white breast meat. Turkey breeding companies operating from the UK have achieved an important position in the European market, as well as having a part of the market share in the USA. Knowledge of the nutrient requirements of turkeys has also advanced and diets to exploit the genetic potential for rapid growth have been formulated with great precision. Canada and North America have led the way in this area. Different feeding strategies are employed within the industry to control the nutrient intake of breeder flocks. These management techniques usually involve limiting the availability of feed, especially to the older males. The intention is to slow down growth rate, thus reducing the likelihood of leg disorders and to maximise breeder production. Throughout the world, the most serious infectious diseases that have impacted upon turkey health are now almost entirely controlled due to improvements in site hygiene and the introduction of live and killed vaccines. In addition, the geographical isolation of turkey growing farms remains an important means of limiting the spread of disease. Now, throughout the USA and Britain, controlled environment housing now operates with greater precision since the ventilation requirements of the stock are better understood. Approximately 90% of the birds in the UK, for example, are produced in large flocks on commercial sites which require precise control of temperature. Feeding and drinking systems have been increasingly mechanised in order to improve efficiency and to ensure that the birds receive adequate fresh feed and water. Equipment such as artificial lighting is also used to overcome the long winters in some of the more extreme areas of the world. While quite popular early on, a vast majority of turkeys are no longer beak trimmed. However, in most cases where birds are kept in natural daylight, the beaks are usually trimmed when the birds are only a few days old. Now, the turkey industry can be divided into three main categories. Primary breeders, breeders and producers. The primary breeders maintain and develop the quality of the genetic stock within the population by selection of the most suitable individuals. Primary breeders sell parent stock to breeders either as hatching eggs or as turkey chicks, which, by the way, are commonly referred to as poults. General characteristics that are important to the health and welfare of the birds are taken into account in breeding. Things such as the ability of the birds to walk without difficulty, reproductive ability, growth and conformation are all key considerations for breeders. Breeders multiply their growing stock by mating parents bought from the primary breeder. A breeder rears the male and female parents from hatching eggs or poults, selecting the best of them to go on to produce fertile eggs from which the growing stock will be hatched. Breeders sell commercial growing stock. Turkey producers can be divided into two groups, relatively large companies whose farms produce turkeys all year round, and relatively small companies and farmers 
whose farms produce turkeys primarily for the seasonal market. The non-seasonal producers account for approximately 90% of the output of the UK industry and are dominated by three major companies. The seasonal producers account for the remaining approximately 10%. The busiest time of year for producers, large and small, is clearly the October to December quarter. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.